Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about health care topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Today's presenter is Dr. Stacy Berry. Dr. Stacy Berry is board certified in obstetrics and gynecology. Well, I'm fortunate enough to care for women from age 13 on up. And actually today I had a 10 year old who was having problems. So I take care of a wide range of decades. So that when they said screening through the decades, I'm gonna start at the beginning. I'm gonna start as teenagers. I just want to go over a little bit about what a screening test is. A lot of patients are super confused about the tests that we do in our office. Screening tests are taking a group of healthy people without any known disease and looking to see if they're at risk for certain diseases. So no, we're not doing diagnostic testing. We're not saying, I see a problem, let's see what it is. We're taking a group of people who are perfectly healthy and see if there's a disease that they're at risk for in the future. And there's some things about screening tests that are universal. So remember, it's a healthy, healthy population that we're doing these tests on. We don't do pap smears on sick people, okay? We don't do mammograms on people with breast cancer or liver cancer or blood cancer. We're taking healthy people who seem to have no problems and we're looking for issues. So it has to be a healthy population. They need to be done in masses. We're talking about whole populations that need to be screened. So it needs to be kind of cheap and it needs to be not very invasive. We need to be able to act with a high positive predictive value. And if a screening test turns positive, we want to do a diagnostic test to follow. We want to make sure that we're not doing these diagnostic tests on a large population of people to find a small portion. We want a screening test that if it's positive, we have a pretty good suspicion there's going to be a disease process there. Take for example, mammography, okay? We do a mammogram, healthy woman, no issues with her breasts. We find an issue, we want to do a diagnostic procedure. Well, we don't want to do a hundred breast biopsies to find one case of breast cancer. We want that test to be, eh, you're going to have a high suspicion of disease, okay? because these are more invasive. When you do diagnostic procedures, they're more invasive. So screening tests are non-invasive, usually don't mean removing tissue from people, um, and they need to be rep reproducible on all populations. Doesn't matter on ethnicity or age. They need to be, these tests need to be reproducible. So that's just a little bit about what a screening test, and I have to say, so many of my patients are confused about this. They'll come in and say, well, I don't have ovarian cancer because I had a normal pap smear five years ago. Well, that's not what pap smears are screening for, okay? It's not a diagnostic test. It's looking for evidence of precancerous changes of the cervix and that's it. So we're gonna go through the different populations, okay? So in researching for this topic, I found that my children were overly screened for way too many things. And the amount of screening tests that are recommended for in children are very few. So we all know that obesity is a major epidemic in this country. And unfortunately, more and more young people are obese. The current, de current statistics from two years ago is that 17% of all teenagers are overweight or obese. So a lot of people have asked, well, should we screen for cholesterol? Maybe. So the, the, it's very controversial. But a kid only needs to be screened once, and that's between the ages of 17 and 21. A little bit earlier, if they have family history of early cardiovascular disease, and that's defined as a, a man who has a heart attack before age 55, or a woman who has a heart attack before age 65, their offspring are considered at risk for cardi cardiovascular disease. I'm sure a lot of us in this room fit into that category, I know my dad had his first heart attack when I was 42, when he was 42, so that puts me at risk for these issues. And a lot of my patients, especially my Southeast Asian patients, have a strong family history of early cardiac disease. They also, if children are, are obese, sedentary, 
which unfortunately a lot of kids today are very sedentary. Or unfortunately, if kids are vaping, they need to be screened earlier, and that's of course a hotbed topic right now, but more and more children are vaping at a young age, and that, that's considered smoking. So do we screen healthy populations of kids for diabetes? We don't. If a child shows overt symptoms of diabetes, such as drinking a lot of water, urinating all the time, rapid weight loss, we're looking for type 1 diabetes, and we screen all symptomatic children. But if they're just healthy kids doing their business, no overt evidence of any disease, they should get a screen every three years starting at puberty. And that's with the A1C. You guys might have heard that term, the hemoglobin A1C. It's what we're all screened for as adults. I, I tell my patients it's like a snapshot. Okay, It's looking at your glycemic control, your blood sugar control for the last three months in a single picture. You do not need to be fasting. It's a very accurate test. And children should be screened every third year starting at puberty. Now, if kids are obese, we're screening for obesity. Now, what does that mean? We do a body mass index. It's just a ratio of height and weight. Every time a kid goes to the pediatrician, they should be weighed and their height should be measured because that changes all the time with kids. And considering overweight are the children that are between 85th and 95th percentile. The top 5th per fifth percentile of the pediatric population is considered um, obese, and that's 17% currently in the U.S which is a complete travesty, and that number is going up. It's going up every year. We've made some in, inroads on in, um, very young children, but the teenage population, the obesity rates continue to climb. Blood pressure, do kids get high blood pressure? Sometimes they do. You don't think about taking a blood pressure on a child, because we never used to do it, but recommendations have changed. All teenagers should have an annual blood pressure with their routine exam. And if kids have other issues such as obesity, di obesity, diabetes, kidney disease, or congenital vascular disease, they need a blood pressure at every visit. And those kids typically go to the doctor more than once a year. So iron deficiency, this is something I see a lot in my patient population because I care for young women. I, as I said, I saw a 10-year-old today who was having menstrual problems, 10 years old with menstrual problems. It's becoming more and more common for young people to start their period much earlier and suffer from excessive menstruation. Obesity creates estrogen in our body. Fat cells create a weak form of estro estro estrogen called estrone. And young people who are bombarded with being overweight from an early age, they have too much estrogen in their body and it initiates puberty earlier. So a child at 10 is not considered pathologic. Okay. When I was first uh, in medical school like 25, 30 years ago, we said if a child started their period before eight, it was considered precocious puberty and you had to investigate. Now we're seeing that in the obese population in certain ethnicities. That used to be at the turn of the last century, 1900s, the average age of starting a period was 16, age 16. In, I, w I grew up in the 60s, the average age was 13.2, okay? And now it's declining to 10.9. Nutrition, okay, nutrition got us from 16 to 12. Those were healthy kids. This stuff earlier has to do with obesity and environmental estrogens that are present in all kinds of plastics, BPA, power lines, environmental estrogens are weakly secreted. So unfortunately what's going to happen is children have their periods much earlier than their mothers did. And you'll also notice that they stop growing at a much earlier age. So they're not reaching the maximal height that their, their mothers did. It's the first time in the history of this country where the new, new generation is shorter than their parents. Yeah, it's kind of fascinating. So, and we also screen for iron deficiency in teens if they're exposed to environmental uh, lead. You know, poor, poor neighborhoods, exposed to freeways. We don't have the lead and gasoline like we did, you know, in the 60s and 70s, thank goodness. But all those kids that lived in urban areas near, near um, major traffic uh, uh, air causeways all had iron deficiency due to the lead poisoning. And now if you have a child that lives in a older home, let's say one of the older homes in Fremont that has peeling paint that may have been painted with lead, they get screened for iron deficiency much earlier. 
And what I screen a lot of young people for is um, for the heavy periods. And these people tend to have very, very uncontrolled heavy periods and very iron deficient at a young age. So SDI is, that stands for sexually transmitted sexual disease that are infectious. So the big ones that we see in this population are chlamydia, chlamydia, and chlamydia. And then some gonorrhea, unfortunately we're seeing a huge spike in syphilis, which may be shocking to you. It's an interesting discussion on why we see that. I don't see, we don't see the syphilis so much in the teenage population but chlamydia is still number one. And we screen every kid at age 16 to age 26. They can say till they're blue in the face that they've never been sexually active, and most of, they ha most of them haven't. But all it takes is taking a urine specimen, and then we send it off for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Yeah, that we see quite a bit of it, in this, even in this community. It's pretty shocking, actually. So we do that for everybody until age 26, even if they've never, they've only been in a monogamous mar relationship, married. So sometimes I get comments from patients like, why did you scream me for chlamydia? You know, you know I'm married, I've only had one, I'm like, I make no judgments. We just screen everybody and then go from there. So HIV, the CDC recommends that every single person in this room be screened for HIV if you're between the ages of 13 and 64 at least once in your life, okay? Most of us, if we're women, get screened more frequently because if you're pregnant, you've obviously had unprotected intercourse, right, which is a risk factor for HIV. So every single pregnant woman gets tested in the state of California for HIV. Now, when I first started my practice over 20 years ago, people had to opt in for it. Now it's required, it's mandatory for all pregnant patients and they have to opt out. And I'd say about 10, 15 years ago, a lot of people were opting out because they were offended by it. But you don't really want to opt out now because if you opt out and you're pregnant when that baby's born, they'll either be treated for suspected HIV or be tested. And you don't want a brand new baby to be screened for things. So every single pregnant patient gets it. Now, if you engage in high-risk behaviors, you're going to be screened more frequently. Homosexual activity, IV drug abuse, uh, multiple partners, all those people are, should be screened even as young as 13 if they engage in these behaviors every three to five years. So you guys probably don't realize, but TB is pretty common around here. And the reason why TB is common is that our population is from all over the world. And they go and visit their homeland where sometimes TB is still endemic. So if a child, routine screening is not recommended for people who are without exposure. Those who've been exposed should be screened. And any person who travels to an endemic nation for more than one week per year needs to be screened. And that's a huge percentage of my population. I'd say over 50% of my patients go back to their home country, which is endemic with TB, on an annual basis or semi-annual basis. So. We do recommend uh, a lot of TB screening in our pregnant population and in the pediatric population. I know my kids have uh, grew, they're gone now, but they grew up in this community and their pediatricians screen them every year for TB because not so much for their travel history, but their peer travel history. Hepatitis B, there's no recommendation for healthy teens. It's just if they're pregnant and we screen every pregnant patient for hepatitis B because again, They've obviously engaged in unprotected intercourse or they wouldn't be pregnant. So they have a risk factor for it. That's all I got on teens. So a big portion of my patient population is in this range, 18 to 39. Why? Because they're of reproductive age and I take care of pregnant women most of, my, most of my day. Again, these are just general public health guidelines. They are definitely designed um, by the patient and her physician. It may be changed, but these are the general guidelines. And I can tell you in our practice, we don't do everything exactly by the book. We make guideline changes based on our patient population. So what immunizations are recommended? This is what we talked about. Everybody should get an annual flu shot. It's just, it saves lives. Even if you've never had the flu shot before, even if you never get sick or every time you get the flu shot, you get sick. I can tell you a million reasons why people refuse to get the flu shot. But especially young women of reproductive age need to get the flu shot every year. 
pregnancy and flu do not mix. They, those women die. They end up on ventilators. It's a much more serious condition if you're pregnant due to the decreased immunity associated with pregnancy. So Tdap, you know, that's your pertussis, your diphtheria, and your tetanus. So it's recommended that all children get two vaccines of that when they're little, when they're first like one or two, and then they get a booster when they're 11. But any of you who have a new baby in your family, and you're gonna spend time with that newborn, you need a Tdap, okay? If you haven't had one with two, within two years and you're around a baby that's less than 18 months old on a routine basis, why? We don't give Tdap to babies. Pertussis is everywhere, that's whooping cough, okay? We have a huge problem with whooping cough in this, in this state because we have little clusters, especially in the Bay Area, of people who choose not to vaccinate their children. Those people put all of our newborns at risk, and California has one of the highest death rates of newborns due to pertussis. Completely preventable, okay? Everybody, if you have a baby in your family and you haven't had a, a Tdap within two years, get one, okay? Especially if it's a brand new baby. And then every 10 years, we all need a booster. So varicella, that's chickenpox. It's shocking to me the percentage of our patients in this community who've never had chickenpox before. Uh, about 80% of my patient population are immigrants. And in certain countries, chickenpox is not that common. So I frequently see young, young women who are pregnant who say, I've, I've never had the chickenpox. Now, it used to, we used to say, if you say that you've never had the chicken pox and we do a study to, on your blood to see if you have, 85% of them actually had it. They just had a subclinical case, but not in this population. If they say they haven't had it, they really haven't had it and they're not immune. So before pregnancy, it's important for them to get vaccinated against chicken pox because if they got pregnant and they get the chicken pox, it can be deadly for the baby. It leads to horrendous infection for mothers. They can get it in their lungs and end up on a ventilator. Um, and their babies can be born deaf. So we want to make sure that if you're planning for a pregnancy and you tell me you've never had chicken pox, I check it out and make sure we vaccinate you before you get pregnant. We cannot vaccinate pregnant women against varicella because it's a live virus and there's risks to the baby. So we want to catch people before they have babies, okay? Um, usually varicella is a lifelong immunity, so if you've had it when you were two or three or four, it doesn't matter, it's still, you're still immune to it. So HPV, this is, the, this is the question that the woman over there had. HPV stands for human papilloma virus. It's what causes cervical cancer in women and head and neck cancer in men, okay? It causes penile cancer in men and get this, 60% of us in this room have been exposed to HPV in our life. Now, we only worry about the people who can't clear the infection naturally, and especially only women after age 30. But our job now, after the last 10 years that we've had a vaccine against HPV, is we need to vaccinate every young person before they're sexually active. This is a sexually transmitted virus. Our goal is to vaccinate 100% of both boys and girls to eradicate the risk of HPV in the future. So if any of you have children or grandchildren in that age range, the target age is 13, 11 to 13, they should get a three course vaccination against HPV. Well, you might've heard a lot of the blowback by community leaders saying, well, if we give them an HPV vaccine, they're just gonna go and have sex. Well, it's just ridiculous. First of all, there's never been any studies to prove that. But let's say, there, let's say a child grew up in a family like that where the parents refused to vaccinate uh, them against a very deadly, deadly disease because they didn't want to give them permission to have sex. Now the CDC has extended the HPV vaccination recommendations to up to age 45, okay? So if you're under the age of 45, especially if you're at risk, meaning you're not in a monogamous relationship and you are currently HPV negative or even HPV positive, it's recommended to complete the course. This is a brand new recommendation. Not a lot of insurers are covering it. The current recommendation that is being insured is up to age 26, but our college is lobbying heavily the insurance companies to, to get that pushed through. And most of my patients are covered. You just have to call. Pap smears. 
get a lot of confusion about a pap smear. People say, well, I went to the emergency room and I got a pap smear. No, you went to the emergency room, you were having a problem, they did a pelvic exam. They looked at the female organs. A pap smear is a screening test, which remember is only on healthy people without any issues. Okay, and it's done as part of a preventive health screening test. Now, a lot of you in this room probably were trained that I get a pap smear every year. I go to the doctor and I get a pap smear every year. Well, we haven't done annual pap smears for about at least 20 years. Why? Because it's way better than it used to be. It used to be that I'd take a sample of cervical mucus with all the blood and inflam inflammatory cells and put it on this slide and put some like hairspray fixative on it and send it to the lab and the pathologist had to like decipher all that. Well, that was very inaccurate. It was better than nothing, but, um, and it saved lives, saves a lot of lives. But now we do a liquid-based technology. So I rinse all those cells off in a liquid media, and that just identifies, the atyp pulls out the atypical cells, so it's a much cleaner test. And then we started adding co-testing, which means add the HPV test. So here's the rules. If you're over age 21, then the controversy is if you've been sexually active or not, okay? If you are sexually active over age 21, you should get a pap smear every three years until you're 30. Okay, there's no HPV testing on that. Why? Because almost everybody has had been exposed to HPV in that population. Okay, we don't test people that young. They have healthy immune systems. Their body will fight it. We only get worried about the ones who have lingering HPV, and that would be the women who are over age 30. So we test women over age 30 for HPV. So if you're over age 30, you get a pap smear every three to five years with an HPV co-test. Again, we do the gonorrhea and chlamydia testing on all people annually after, until age 26. And then of course, if they have symptoms, we do it more than that. And then these women should get a clinical breast exam. That means I do their breast check, feel for lumps and bumps, nipple drainage, that type of stuff. They should also be doing self breast exam monthly. So a lot of my patients, again, still think that they're supposed to get an annual pap smear. Let's just dispel that myth. There's no, there's no reason for an annual pap. There's no need for a traditional pap, meaning one of those slides. They should all be liquid-based technology. And in our practice, even though we have a really low-risk practice, we err on the side of three years instead of five years. Just because I think we've all been burned. You know, if we go to five years, We've all been burned. We've seen the rare cervical cancer pop up under our screening. So we err on the side of every three years. Kaiser uh, does every five, because that's Kaiser. They tend to do things that are more population-based. They take their chances, and they do less screening. Yep. In this age range, everyone should get a blood pressure check. So when we're screening for blood pressure, we're screening for hypertension, which is a risk factor for stroke and heart disease. So again, these are healthy people without symptoms. People can walk around with blood pressure 180 over 110 and have no idea. They don't feel anything. So it's a silent killer. So we do blood pressure. In our office, we do it every time they come in. If they come in every week, we do blood pressure every week. But it's recommended if you're healthy and you're like, I don't know if I should go to the doctor, you should get a blood pressure every other year in this age range, okay? Cholesterol, we don't really have a lot of testing recommendations. You see this, the first time you get your cholesterol test should be anywhere between age 20 and 45. And never repeat it more than every five years if it's normal. I can't tell you how many young people come in and say, it's time for my cholesterol test, because they assume that they need the annual blood work. There's no point in that. If it's healthy, there's no way it's going to bump enough to be treated. So once every five years until age 45. So if you're, if you're testing for diabetes, if you're overweight, which is a BMI of greater than 25 for Caucasians, okay, Asian people have a lower BMI, which makes them overweight, which is, yeah. So if an if a Asian woman has a BMI of 23, she's considered overweight, it needs to be screened for, or if she has high blood pressure. And then the eye exam, these are people who think they have no problem, they should get one at least every two years until age 45, and dental exams are recommended every one to two years for prevention. These are people without any dental issues. So another interesting thing about caring for this patient population is 
I have a huge percentage of patients who are expecting their first baby in their 20s, 30s, or older who've never once been to a doctor, a dentist, never. Isn't that shocking? It just blows my mind. Uh, they go in other countries if something needs to be pooled. They don't go for pre prevention routinely. So it's always hard for me to get people into the dentist, but it's very important during pregnancy to get dental exams. So at our visits with patients, and all primary care doctors typically do this too, we always ask questions about mood, depression, and we talk about diet, exercise, alcohol use, tobacco use, seatbelts, smoke detectors, oh I said seatbelts twice there, I'm sorry. And then at this age, it's only recommended that patients observe their skin, and if they have a lesion that looks funny, itchy, changes, grows, they should get that checked out. But routine total body skin screening is not typically recommended unless they're in a high risk group. Okay, the major portion of my patient population is where I'm at, 40 to, 40 to 64. And again, these are for healthy women without any symptoms of anything, any known disease states. Well, as you can imagine, as we get closer to 64, there's less and less of these people out there because most people have a disease or two by the time they're 64. Um, but I, it's, I have a fair amount of people who are in their 60s who have no known medical problems and take no medications or are perfectly healthy. So we still screen these women for disease. So blood pressure annually, cholesterol every five years if it's normal, okay? So there's no reason even in this age for annual cholesterol screening. Although I'm sure every single one of your primary care doctors does it. There's no recommendation that it improves life or decreases disease states. Diabetes every three years, but annually if you're overweight or have hypertension. Well, in our patient population, over 70% of people are technically overweight. So they should probably have an annual diabetes screen. And again, that's with the A1C testing, which is that snapshot of our glycemic control over a three month window. Very accurate. Eye exams, you know, increase as you get older, every one to three years. I know my eye doctor has me come every year. I'm not really sure why, but he does. <laughs> so I get new frames. That's a, and again, dental once or twice per year. Immunizations, annual flu shot, Tdap every 10, unless you have a new baby in the family, okay? Shingles and herpes and zoster, herpes zoster. So shingles is a reactivation of the chickenpox chicken pox virus in a single dermatone. It is a very, have any of you had shingles in this, off, in this room? Thank it. It's horrible, right? Horrible. And it can t lead to long-term complications such as chronic pain. So it's currently recommended for all people over age 50. That's a new recommendation. It used to be age 65. So that is something, if you can prevent it, you should, because it can lead to serious morbidity, not just pain and, and embarrassment with a scarring rash, but it can lead to long-term nerve complications. I know my father got it inside his ear, and it attacked his laryngeal nerve. He couldn't talk for six months. So we're, it, we're not talking about just a rash and pain. We're talking about things that can really impact people long term. So it, it's no, no fun, no bueno. And again, now we recommend HPV up to age 45. If you want to get vaccinated and you're under age 45, please contact your insurers. Again, this is a brand new CDC recommendation as of last October. Insurance companies are having a hard time keeping up with the recommendations. But it is recommended by the CDC and our college, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Colorectal screening, everyone's favorite subject. Okay, so remember, these are people who are healthy. They have no disease state. They're not having blood in their stool. They're not having abdominal pain. They're perfectly healthy. We want to screen healthy individuals for diseases. Why? Because colorectal cancer kills a lot of people in this country. Cancer happens, right? Breast cancer happens, lung cancer happens. So we can screen for it and prevent it, right? Not just diagnose it, but prevent it. So since colon cancer screening has become more widely accepted, the rates of colon cancer have been declining significantly. 
just like breast cancer. And the gold star example of declining cancer rates is cervical cancer. In 1946, when the pap smear was, was dis invented, discovered, cervical cancer killed a lot of women, over 50,000 per year in this country. And that was when our population was much, much, much smaller. Our current cervical cancer death rates in this country are less than 2,000. Why? Screening. I mean, I, I've been in this practice for 21 years. I've had two cases of cervical cancer in my practice, and I see 5,000 patients a year. Those were two women who had never had a pap smear. So if you've never had a pap smear, your chances are pretty high. But even if you've had one pap smear after age 30, your chances are significantly declined because you're either put into a high-risk category for frequent screening or you're treated as a low-risk person. So pap smears say, have dramatically saved lives. In the rest of the world, they don't do pap smear screening. Huge problem, massive problem still, lots of deaths. Every single person in this room, if you're over age 50, should have a contract with your primary care doctor discussing colorectal screening or even your obstetrician gynecologist. You have options, okay? You, if you're low risk, meaning you have no family history and no symptoms, you have options for screening. You can do annual screening, you can do every three year screening, or every 10 or five year or 10 year screening. And what are they? So you guys might remember the guaiac testing where you get a rectal exam in the doctor's office and we put it on a piece of paper and put a little dose of uh, chemical on there to see if there's occult blood, meaning hidden blood in the stool specimen. That's an option. Or you can get a little kit from your doctor and they'll give you three little cards and you smear your stool on it every day for three days, send it to the lab. That's done annually. That's pretty good at diagnosing cancer. Okay. But you got to remember colon cancer starts way before cancer. Okay. It starts as a polyp and it converts into an adenomatous polyp which is a precancerous dysplasia polyp, and then it goes to cancer. And that timeline takes 10 years from benign polyp to cancer. So that occult testing that you do, this annual screening is only going over here. It's only checking for this. It's not gonna find those people that are at increased risk to develop this. So that's an option, it's a fine option if you're low risk. Now they have those new tests, which you've probably seen ads for on television, called Cologuard. That's a DNA test. They're looking at the DNA of tumors in your stool. Much more accurate. It'll detect cancer at 92%. Not 100%, 92, okay? But again, it won't check the polyp people, and it won't check the hyperplastic people. It'll just detect the cancer people which is great, but it won't detect all of them. But it's a fine option and we do that every three years. You can do some minimally invasive procedures called a sigmoidoscopy. That's where it just goes up to the sigmoid, which is the very tail end of the large intestine. You can do an enema with um, barium contrast, which is barium injected up through the rectum and then they take photos to look for little deep filling defects and x-rays. Or you can do an, a CT scan of, of, with radiation, of course, which looks no, non-invasive, no prep required, and that's done every five years. The gold standard in this community is a screening colonoscopy. Your first one is at age 50, okay? If you're of African-American descent, it's 45 because they have a higher incidence of colorectal cancer. And they often present very late. I've, I've noticed that in my practice over the years. I've, the, the patients of mine who've had advanced colon cancer are young people of African-American descent who were before the screening cutoff of 50. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to do a colonoscopy. Why? Because it's the prep. It's not fun. You know, there's, depending on your risk factors, you either do two bottles of magnesium citrate couple du Ducalac suppositories, have an absolutely miserable night, and then you get the procedure done. But why is it the gold standard? Because it's gonna find these guys, the polyps. It's gonna find the hyperplastic polyps. And guess what? If they find those, you never get that. 
you never get the colon cancer. So it's screening and diagnostic and preventative. So if you have a negative colon, uh, colonoscopy, even if you only have one in your life, they say the chance of developing colon cancer goes down by 60%. I don't understand. So it's the gold standard if you can tolerate the procedure. It requires anesthesia, it requires a prep, it requires a healthy person to, who is not involved in the situation to drive you to the surgery center. And it, my, the biggest issue my patients have with colonoscopy is just the embarrassment. You know, we have, our, in our group, we have two fabulous gastroenterologists, but they're both men. All my patients are women. A lot of them are very shy women. And so they defer their life-saving cancer screening over embarrassment. Well, I got to tell you, parts are parts. I see parts all day long. I don't ever worry about parts. I'm just looking for disease. So I try to really encourage people to get over their fear, suck it up, and if it's normal, you're good for 10 years. One day out of every 10 years to potentially save your life or a lot of world of hurt, it's worth it. Now a lot of you like will be saying, well, I never got a 10 year because you had a polyp. So if you have a polyp and if it's an atypical polyp, you're gonna be going every three years and they're not gonna let you get cancer, okay? It's just like if you come to me for a pap smear, you're not getting cervical cancer on my watch. There's no way. So that's my recommendation is, and every major medical institution says the same thing, colonoscopy is the gold standard for screening. Okay, so breast cancer screening. This is probably the most controversial of all screening tests in the US. Why? Because everybody's friggin' fanatically paranoid about breast cancer, right? Because, nah, they really shouldn't be. But you shouldn't be paranoid about it. Okay, because the survival rates are through the roof right now. So this is the deal. Everybody should do a monthly self-breast exam. It doesn't matter if you're having periods or not. If you're not having periods, once, once a month, pick a day, any day. I always say start on the first of the month. Do a self-breast exam. In the shower, soap on your hands, or laying flat on your back in bed with your arm elevated above your head, okay? There's no special technique to it. Just feel your boob, okay? The whole boob, starting at the tail, going all through the area, making sure there's no nipple discharge. Just do it every month. Just getting a good habit of it. You should get a, a physician to do a breast exam every year, okay? And then bottom line with mammograms, they save lives, okay? It's just a fact. Now people always wanna talk about so many things about mammograms and there are many, many organizations which, dic which dictate the frequency of screening tests and guess what, none of them agree about mammograms. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. I'm gonna tell you what my college says, okay? My college says, well, they just changed the recommendations. But my general MO is when you're 40, if you have no family history, you start mammograms. And I recommend you get one every year until you're age, 60, until you're age 75. Unless you're super, 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 super healthy and it looks like you're gonna live to be like 110 or 120, then we go further. Yeah. <laughs> Some people, now the new recommendation with our college is you sit down and you have a discussion at age 40 about when you want to initiate screening. My discussion goes like this. Does anyone in your family have breast cancer? No. How old were you when you had your first baby? If you're under age 30, that decreases your risk, okay? Did you breastfeed your babies for at least a year? That decreases your risk too, okay? So if you meet all those criteria, you've never had a breast biopsy, you've never had any kind of breast surgery, you're 40 years old, you had your first baby when you're 26, you breastfed all three children for a year each, you can have the option to delay your initiation of screening. Now, will we be right all the time? Will we be sure that that person doesn't have breast cancer? No, but the odds are that they won't, okay? So they can choose to start their screening later. And I leave it up to the patients. They know the risks and benefits. Now, very few of my patients fall into those categories. Almost everybody has a family history of breast cancer. Almost everybody in my population has their first baby after age 30. And luckily, more of my patients breastfeed more than now than ever, but some, some don't. So those people I do recommend annual mammography. The other thing is people always wanna say, well, I want, I want the quad, view, I want, 
I want to add an um, ultrasound and I want to add an MRI and none of those things are recommended for low risk patients, okay? Just a standard digital mammography that you get just down the hall is considered the gold standard for screening, okay? There are certain people who need MRIs for their screening and those are people who have super high risks of breast cancer and we do a test called, we do a little survey based on the patient's history called the Gale model when they come to Washington for their for mammography and it will give you a, an estimate of your chance of developing breast cancer by the time you're 90. If people are above a 20% chance of developing breast cancer, then we want to sit down and have a conversation with them about MRI or ultrasound as well for screening. Unfortunately, when we go down that path, we're going to have a lot of false positives. People tend to end up with a lot of biopsies that are unnecessary. So it's a trade-off be between better detection rates and more invasive procedures. So it's a conversation that requires sitting down with your provider and going over those. My patients who have a Gale model of greater than 20 percent, you know, I sit down and let them decide going over the pros and the cons of that. Plus MRI, I don't know if you guys have ever had an MRI, it's loud, it's kind of scary, <laughs> it's kind of claustrophobic, so, and then you end up with more risk of having breast biopsies. So. It's a double-edged sword, but it's out there for people in select groups. So lung cancer. Thank goodness my patient population are not smokers. But if any of you in the room ever smoked, it's now recommended that you have an annual, every year, low-dose lung CT scan for screening if you're between ages of 55 and 80. Now that's for people who are currently smoking or if you have a 30-pack year history. So what does that mean? 30 pack year. Okay, it can mean a lot of things. It could mean, could mean that you smoked one pack a day for 30 years. Okay, one times 30 is a 30 pack year. It could mean that you smoked a half a pack every day for 60 years. Half times 30, 60 is 30. It could mean that you smoke three packs a day for 10 years, okay. It doesn't matter, it's a combination of how much you smoked for how long and you just multiply the two. So if you're currently smoking and you have a 30 pack hair history or if you've quit in the last 15 years, yeah. Annual low dose lung CT scan, okay? So if you have a 30 pack hair history and you currently smoke, let's say you're a smoker, and you've been smoking like, you know, for, for 15 years, two packs, then you need to get one if you're over age. But yeah, this is something that is a fairly new recommendation. Why? Because lung cancer is the number one cancer that kills women in this country now. I bet you if I asked you people what you thought, you'd all say breast cancer, number two. Lung cancer is number one. There's more breast cancer diagnosed but our cure rates are so high, it's only the second leading cancer death for women. Number one is lung cancer. Why delayed screening? This is hopefully gonna change that. Bone density, okay. So that's the other big screening thing that we do, bone density screening. We're looking for osteoporosis, osteopenia. Why? Because when people thin their bones and they get an adult fracture, they die. A woman who has a hip fracture has a 50% chance of mortality within six months. Why? Because they're sitting around, they're immobilized, everything else goes to pot when you're laying around, right? If you don't expand your lungs, you're at risk for pneumonia, you're at risk for blood clots. So osteoporosis is no joke, plus it's a cause of chronic pain for women. You know, we think about hips and we think about that type of stuff, but the, the major issue is we end up like grandma, right? What is that? That kyphotic widow's peak. You all see women walking around like this. They can't even lift their head. That's compression of their vertebrae. They're crunching their vertebrae. Well, what's in between the vertebrae? Nerve roots. It's so painful to have those conditions. So you may see women walking around like that, and that means that every single one of their vertebrae is compressed and they're living in co constant pain. We screen women starting at age 65 for osteoporosis. 
unless you have risk factors. And a huge percentage of my patients have risk factors. So any woman in this room, if you were over age 50 and had a fracture, even if it was something that like you kind of deserve the fracture, <laughs> you should still be screened. Like if you had a hard fall, um, and you, you should still be screened. I unfortunately had a very bad fracture last year, and I was 50, so I'm being screened because even though it was, it were, there was a reason for the fracture, it's still a risk factor. Other things increase our risk for bone thinning before that age, and hypothyroidism is one of the things. Well, a huge percentage of our patient population is hypothyroid, including me, so again, I'm gonna be screened early. Alcohol users are more likely to have osteoporosis and should be screened early. Smokers are the big issue. They have very poor bone health and they should be screened early. And then a family history of osteoporosis. I don't know about you, but my grandmother, my great grandmother by the time she was 65 was probably three or four inches shorter than when she started. So that's another thing we screen for is we, we measure the height of postmenopausal women annually in our practice. We're looking for loss of height. If you've lost height, that's because those little compressions fractures have happened and you're, that's a screening test for osteoporosis. Geriatric recommendations. Remember, we're talking about screening. Screening is for healthy populations. Okay, when we hit 75, not a lot of people fit that criteria, meaning they have no known medical problems or diseases after age 75, but there are some. And those people, the CDC rec does not recommend a lot of screening for these people. Uh, we stop all screening for colon cancer at age 75, and we remember that's healthy people without blood in their stool, uh, without abdominal pain, no diverticulitis, diverticulosis. Breast cancer screening, there's a lot of people that I stopped breast cancer screening on way before age 65. Okay, if you've had open heart surgery, you've had a stroke, I'm not gonna do a screening on you for breast cancer, okay? There's things that are going to kill you way before a potential breast cancer would kill you. But I still have a couple like 85 and 90 year old women who would blow your mind. I mean, they're living independently, they're caring for their siblings, sometimes they're caring for their children, and they got another 10 years in them. They got another 20 years in them. So then I, I offer it. I say, do you want a breast cancer screen? And, and I kind of assess where they're at in their life. Are they healthy enough to stand surgery if we find something? Are they healthy enough to withstand chemotherapy if I find something? Sometimes that answer is yes. It's very rarely yes. But I got a handful of them, and so I screen those women still for breast cancer. Usually after 75, I just do a clinical breast exam. If I find a, a lump or a bump, we'll biopsy it. But we're not necessarily looking for microcalcifications or precancerous conditions. Everybody in this age range should be fully immunized against influenza. And don't forget about the pneumococcal vaccine, which is recommended at age 65, the pneumonia shot. And then again, one dose of zoster if you haven't been vaccinated yet or you're getting a booster at that age. I would recommend you talk to your primary care doctor about the current recommendations for that because they're kind of all over the board when I was doing research for this. And again, I don't, I don't, do, this, I don't do those vaccinations in my office. You should still continue to screen until age 65 for diabetes according to the protocol, cholesterol, and then the bone density as well. Bone density, I tend to go much longer, especially if they're still mobile. If people are still walking, they should be screened because they're at risk for fracture if they fall. And we should treat them if they have the condition. So again, as I told you about my lovely little patient who's 86 that I saw this week, I got another screen on her. I didn't get a mammogram. I didn't do a pap smear. I didn't do a pelvic exam. But I did a clinical breast exam and a bone density. Why? Because she's still kicking. And if she falls, I don't want her to, to fracture. So again, on screening, it's usually included in the annual preventative exam. These are covered without co-pays, okay? According to the American, um, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act. So people are always shocked. You've gotten such a habit over the years of going to the doctor and having your $10 copay or your $20 copay. Preventive health screening does not have a copay. And again, just a general rule, screening tests are only designed for healthy people without an active disease state. 
Always review vaccination records with your primary care on an annual basis, okay? That's it.